In today's podcast for Inquiry, I speak with Dr. Tara Moriarty. Dr. Moriarty is an associate professor and infectious diseases researcher in the University of Toronto Faculties of Dentistry and Medicine. Dr. Moriarty has a PhD in molecular biology from McGill University. She now leads COVID-19 Resources Canada, a largely volunteer organization coordinating and providing support from Canadian scientists to the COVID-19 response. COVID-19 Resources Canada publishes a bi-weekly report on the current Canadian COVID-19 situation for each Canadian province. In today's episode, I speak with Dr. Moriarty about how she became a science communicator. She describes the reaction of the scientific community and the public, and shares some surprising statistics about the current state of the COVID-19 pandemic in Canada. I bring you my conversation with Dr. Tara Moriarty. Welcome to the Podcast for Inquiry, brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada, a national educational charity supporting your community for reason, compassion, and secular humanist values. You have answers, we have questions. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblatt, board member and secular chair for CFIC. Welcome. Dr. Tara Moriarty, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today on Podcast for Inquiry. Thank you very much for having me. I want to get to what you've been doing for the last few years, uh, and because you've been what is probably one of the most dangerous uh, uh, jobs that's not involved with fighting fires, uh, but uh, uh, and that's been you've been a, a professional scientist that has been a COVID communicator with the public, and that has had a lot of uh, attention drawn to yourself and, and a lot of people like you. And I, that's what I want our main topic of conversation to be. But before we get there, I was hoping you could introduce yourself to our audience and uh, uh, tell us what uh, what your foundational scientific knowledge is and how you got to being in a place that put you uh, well-suited to be a COVID communicator. Yes. So first of all, I'm not sure if I was well-suited to be a COVID communicator. It's it's a learning process. Um, but um, so I, I did my PhD in molecular and cellular biology. Um, I was working on how uh, the ends of linear chromosomes are replicated and uh, uh, went to go and study how they were being replicated in uh, a bacteri- the bacterium that causes Lyme disease, which is a really fascinating genome. And uh, after I made that transfer, I continued working in that area. But one of the major projects that worked for me um, was co-developing with uh, another postdoctoral fellow in an immunology lab, um, a method that allowed us to visualize uh, uh, individual bacteria living and moving um, in, uh, in a living host. And so at that point, I switched to infectious diseases and uh, started learning more about that. Started my own research lab to study how bacteria spread through the bloodstream and kind of biophysics of, uh, and uh, molecular biology of how they interact with the, our vessel blood walls and, and escape. So, um, because I was working on Lyme disease, there is a fair bit of um, uh, controversy and sometimes misinformation about Lyme disease um, on social media. So I had started uh, working in that area and trying to make myself accessible as a scientist um, for questions uh, about Lyme disease, because it was clear that people needed to be able to talk. And um, so I had started working in that area and started being more public on Twitter but really on Twitter, I started because uh, our first big paper in my lab, the editor said, get on Twitter and start talking about it. So that's how I started a Twitter account. And then over time- Back, back uh, in the days uh, back in the days when Twitter was, uh, was a desirable way to get information out to the public. Oh, I discovered it was this amazing world I discovered of scientists and 
things were challenging. Both my parents were ill at that time, and I was their primary caregiver. I was having trouble challenge or trouble traveling to meetings, and so I actually loved Twitter because it was like a journal club, you know, where um, I found out about all kinds of different things, and I stayed on top of um, a lot of different fields, and I loved it as a learning tool. Um, but then when COVID happened. It, it there was such a need and I had so many friends and colleagues who were just in the trenches trying to respond um, that I realized that something that scientists could do who were not directly working in public health and elsewhere was to be communicators and that we could use our share our knowledge and skills to support people and to help um, people navigate and also help our colleagues who were absolutely overwhelmed with what needed to be done to respond to COVID. So that was how it started. And then it just grew over time um, as I got frustrated with things, knowing what people needed and that they weren't getting like information about COVID or what the situation is like and things like that. It sort of, it developed, right? And I have a lot of skills analyzing data and apparently, uh, talking with people. And I love talk. It's really enjoyable talking with people. Yeah. Well, that last bit anyway, talking with people is also a, a passion yeah. of mine, which is uh, yeah. one of the reasons why I'm the host of Podcast for Inquiry. Also, although not a scientist of uh, any discipline, uh, getting yeah. information, ac- learning and getting a- accurate information out to people is uh, a value that I hold dearly. So I'm, I'm very glad to get uh, people like yourself uh, it, to get be able to talk to people like yourself. Uh, now, how do you cut through the noise uh, when I mean on Twitter everybody has a limited number of uh, of characters that they can type. Uh, people yeah. can sound authoritative without actually the knowledge uh, under uh, underlying certain pronouncements. Uh, how do you cut through the people that are simply wrong or deliberately misleading to have your voice heard and understood by the public at large? What what techniques did you employ and how did you get your message out? Um, so certainly this was not done in an intentional fashion. I had no plan about how it was going to happen. It was that I learned as I go. Um, in terms of listening and making decisions, I read a lot. Um I read a lot. Uh, I look at um, I look at methods a lot, how things are done, and there are many, many things that I don't comment on um, on Twitter because I don't feel I understand them well enough, or I'm still trying to uh, make up my mind. Things are complicated. Um, in terms of cutting through the noise to reach people, um, I think part of it was spontaneous. You know, the the organization I co-founded with uh, another scientist at McGill, a genomic scientist, um, COVID-19 Resources Canada, we initially formed right at the beginning of COVID because um, he was seeing, and we were seeing on Twitter, that scientists all over Canada were trying to find materials they needed to do research, and, and it was it was mayhem. And I was seeing that I'd be wondering why Canada wasn't seeing mobilization of scientists the way it had happened in Korea, for example, and in Germany. So we, on the same day, started going out on Twitter and um, asking people, was there a need, would anyone like to get together, in my case, to coordinate volunteer scientists to make a sign-up sheet, in his case, a way to coordinate sharing of reagents and and knowing who's working on what. And so um, that started and, you know, we had about, oh, it was amazing, 7,000 scientists, scientifically trained people across the country who signed up to volunteer, ranging from emeritus professors, full professors who just shut their labs down, graduate students, people working in various government ministries who were sidelined, everyone who wanted to contribute. And in the beginning, a lot of it was just um, helping to crowdsource and get data out. But a lot of it was also simply getting volunteers into places, you know, like Meals on Wheels lost almost all of its volunteers, many of whom are seniors. So we were deploying people who said, I can help, I can, I can bring Meals on Wheels to people. 
and things like that. And so we that, oh, that's, doing- that's amazing. I, I had no idea that uh, your efforts uh, were, were so expansive. I, I, like I, I was, I'm aware of your work in terms of COVID communications, but uh, yeah. delivering meals to those who, who can't, uh, who, who, who can't can't cook and get their own and and, and really helping people yeah. on the ground that's uh, that's incredible well we didn't I mean it was it was a major gap right and we had all I had started I had transitioned my lab entirely online earlier than the university had directed it because I could see what was coming I knew and so I was kind of ready and uh, and uh, Guillaume Bork who was my uh, co uh, collaborator, I guess, was they were mainly uh, online based anyway, and so we were kind of ready. And uh, there were a lot of people whose research labs were shut down, who couldn't, who were at home, and we were like, "What can I do?" And so initially, it helped channel. There was so much volunteerism across Canada. So many people who were making masks, who were doing anything they could to help. So all we did was help coordinate and channel some of that. And we were, you know, not effective at lots of things, but we just kind of tried to find a way to get people together quickly. So that's how it started. And then over time, we ended up filling gaps. And then, um, you know, other organizations formed that took on certain roles. We contributed to the formation of, of some organizations like um, Science at First and, and um, Can COVID, which coordinated researchers. Um, and then over time, the needs changed. And, you know, what I started realizing was that um, around the summer of last year, I guess, I realized that even earlier than that, I realized that people lacked information about what the COVID situation was like. And that progressively, as people were um, kind of the responsibility for making decisions and protecting themselves was shifting to individuals um, from governments. Um, the problem was that people didn't have the information they needed to make these decisions in an informed way. <coughs> Sorry. So we started trying to respond to that in early 2022, started trying to set up models, figure out ways to estimate what the current COVID situation was like, and then started sharing that around the, the summer, around this time, a bit later, um, last year, uh, when we started doing a COVID forecast that would help people to make decisions. And then a lot of the, uh, so there weren't as many uh, scientists who were involved as people were pulled back to their regular jobs, but we had a dedicated community of people who used resources and who had extraordinary talents in many different ways and who are still with us, who started working with us to help the scientists who are not very good at communicating about non-technical or you know in a non-technical way helping us to develop resources that would reach people and say this is what we need um so we are sort of in this space now where it's almost like we're doing community driven research um it's an area as a researcher that i am not expert in we're learning as we go but i guess what we keep trying to do is respond to needs that are emerging um, and provide the support to people that they need and to act as scientists serving society, I guess, but to act at, we have specialized skills that we can lend to conversations that can be helpful, but we are human beings and who are part of those conversations. We are part of communities and we're, we're pitching in like everyone else using the specialized skills we have that may be useful in certain circumstances is how I would frame it now. And I don't really know <laughs> how to do what I'm doing, but experience is a powerful educator and um, we're figuring it out as we go. And I'm not, I'm comfortable making mistakes or learning as I go in public. I don't mind that and changing and changing my mind. So you know, for me, it, it's fine. Um, the main thing is to be as effective as possible and to support people and be oriented towards people who need the support using the information that I'm reading and everything else, but but oriented towards their needs, um, you know, over the, the, the I guess, the, the, the needs or, or maybe the priorities of um, some of my professional colleagues. And it's just that orientation, I think, that maybe helps me listen or hear 
um, some things um, in a way that's driven where we are now. But it's it's just it's happened. I don't know how it happened, and I don't know how we kept through. But I think over time, people have valued what we're trying to provide, and that's why um, you know I've become this voice um, because we keep trying to meet needs, I guess. And, um, and hopefully one day, uh, I won't be needed in that way. Right. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's the idea that's, thing. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the goal. I, I well, hopefully yeah. that, that, that bleep, I, I've got, well, three questions, but they're each big. So I'm going to ask them one at a time. Uh, about 15 years ago, I read a biography of Carl Sagan and, yeah. uh, the, his scientific peers, the scientific community at the time uh, was quite critical of him for his outreach efforts, for his uh, desire to be a science communicator, to educate the public about the foundations of, of science, to be a public speaker for the Cosmos series. You're a scientist. You're not supposed to be a TV star. You're clearly just you know, after the fame and glory. And, and if you're after that, you couldn't possibly be a, a, a good scientist. I, I'm perhaps painting too broad a brush, but that was a, mm -hmm. uh, a prominent uh, perspective from within the scientific community. Now, that was a generation ago, and you have gone from being a, you know, essentially a hardcore research scientist to de uh, devoting a significant uh, chunk of your time uh, and efforts in into being a science communicator, and yeah. I'd like to ask you: Is your experience anything like uh, like Carl Sagan's, or has has the scientific community uh, changed its views about the value of having a scientifically literate public? Uh, so that is a very very big question, and um, you know my perspective on this is informed by uh, my personal experience. I don't know what everyone thinks. and, and Sure. So I, I I'm not asking you to speak uh, for everybody, but I am asking about your experience. Yeah. So, you know, what I would say is that there is a better appreciation of the importance of this, and there's been nothing clear. Uh, COVID has been a, a really, really um, stark illustration of the importance of this role. Um, and the importance of supporting people, the importance of this role for fighting misinformation. Um, there's, oh, you know, you can publish as many things as you want, you can, but it, you still need to get out there and talk. And one of the things we know is that people build personal trust, that personal trust in other people is important for people's um, health and medical decisions, and that you need to build relationships and social media actually it's not perfect um but it does allow that in a way that's more accessible um than um than you know writing pieces in conventional media or certainly in academic academic media you know there are always so there are always people of different priorities um certainly um um, I think that um, there are many scientists who support what I'm doing. There are some who are critical. Um, it's, it's always a, a mixture. Um, and I think it maybe depends a little bit. Um, I think sometimes people, uh, I think it depends on who people are oriented towards or who they're listening or thinking of um, when they're, they're communicating. So Twitter my favorite thing about Twitter um, back in the day was that it was a way to talk to other scientists and other researchers in the field. And it was very, we were very inward focused, you know, we were talking to each other and it was a way to chat. And I adore that about Twitter. And much of that about Twitter is gone now, which is absolutely heartbreaking. Um, but, um, but there's, but I actually very, do very little of that anymore on Twitter, and I'm mainly focused outward to people who are seeking support and who, for example, can't go and uh, reach a doctor because of where they live or because we have such a healthcare shortage, people who can't access other trusted people. Um, and so, uh, so there's been a mixture and some people are critical, but by and large, I would say that most of my colleagues have greatly appreciated and really do understand the value of it. 
um, and and also understand it's it's not it you know your research my research programs have taken a hit my other programs it's it's a difficult choice to make as a researcher and and sometimes my colleagues understand that really well and admire you know that uh, I'm still trying to make this choice because it's still important so. You know, and then there are lots of people who are critical too, and I don't know, it's human beings. <laughs> we, you know, we're we're not always good about supporting other people. We can we can be pretty critical, but um, that's kind of there. There still is a very profound need, and I guess my perspective is that as long as we're seeing high levels of excess mortality of people dying of COVID, or just in general in Canada, then there is still a need for me to be out there all the time, making sure people know and know what to do. And the day that all of that gets quieter, um, I can slowly fade and and maybe uh, work on something else. And, you know, but the need is still urgent. Um, so I, I can't walk away. All right, so th thank you. Uh, I want to ask then, what the react what your experience is of the reaction from the public uh, throughout the pandemic uh, i've read a lot of accounts of uh scientists being threatened or dismissed oh. uh, covid covid is a lie or uh you know we've got uh hydrochloroquine or ivermectin our our covid cures and people like you are in the pocket of i'm not entirely sure who big pharma big government uh, uh the deep state uh you're just rogue and want to take over the world and this is your nefarious plan to do so so denouncing not just your work but there's also been again i've read accounts of of threats of violence of doxing of oh, yeah. uh uh you know attempts to get discredit the work not through the scientific process but you know you've you've clearly you clearly eat babies for breakfast every morning or something like or, you know very, quite defamatory uh, statements yeah. to try and get their message uh from reaching the public or to get their jobs their positions or titles uh revoked and i'm wondering uh have you experienced any of that or have people simply uh welcomed your message and taken uh, yeah. the data that you communicate yeah. and uh you know, adjust their behaviors according to the rational yeah. response to to information i I, I, I'm sort of, I, I realize that it's probably neither extreme, but I yeah. would like to know what has been the reaction to your efforts from the public and has it changed uh, both as the COVID pandemic has evolved and as your own efforts and methods have evolved in response to uh, your, your attempts to be as effective as possible over the course of the last, oh my gosh, three and a half years now. I know. I know. Um, well, I think we're all really tired, but yes, it just keeps going. Um, so first of all, I did have experience with that before um, COVID of, you know, um, uh, people, um, uh, you know, trying, you know, uh, contacting the, you know, uh, various leaders at the University of Toronto. So, and I've had, you know, uh, there've had to be investigations that have had to be done. There've had to be academic panels that have assembled to look at whether my activities um, online um, represent misinformation, whether they're, uh, you know, <clears throat> all of this. So I had experience with it. And the first time- And this was all prior to the pandemic. Prior, yeah. And the first time it absolutely frightened me because- I just, um, I just, first of all, it was very time consuming and, um, and I, and it frightened me and I certainly did not have tenure at that point either. And, um, and it was, it was quite a, um, it was quite a shock, but I kept doing it because it was really important, but I had a key experience, which was that the University of Toronto and the, the committee, which was struck to invest formally investigate this complaint that had been made, was very supportive and said that, in fact, I was doing what, you know, it was hoped that <laughs> that every academic in the university, if they had the ability, would be willing to do. And, and it was very supportive. And, and so that helped. Um, and uh, so some of those things, um, 
I certainly had had plenty of death threats and threats to my family and others before COVID. Um, so I had some experience of that and it wasn't as viscerally frightening as, as it was. Um, and then during COVID for a long time, I mean, there was lots of that stuff, right? And certainly lots of, you know, I am um, very overweight, for example. So I get people would say, why would I take my advice from a fat cow, right? Like there's tons of that kind oh. of stuff. Right. Well, you, no, you, I, only a I, runway I, model can be a, can be a scientist. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've seen the movies. I know. Matter, right. Like just anything. Right. It, it's it's like it's like people, you know, referring to uh, picking any aspect of someone's identity to try to undermine them, whether they're, you know, Jewish or a woman or fat, you know, like the, the, all of these sort of identity based ways of of trying to undermine or delegitimize um, people and also just to, you know, hurt and embarrass like anything, right, to get people to stop talking. Um, so, you know, that stuff is, is whatever. But um, for the first part of COVID, I never ever, I, I every reply, I didn't block, I left for a long time, I, I just and I actually tried over and over again to respond but the volume of it got to be so bad and around the point where every time anything was posted about COVID that there was almost like a systematic campaign of accounts and trolls and whatever that would post tons and tons of misinformation around that time I thought I'm not going to be a platform for this information my, my I don't want my reach to be a platform for this misinformation so I started blocking accounts that were doing this consistently and that we're not genuinely there to interact with anyone. Um, and so I, uh, and, and I eventually started having to employ, um, you know, other blocking tools to, to keep that down to a minimum so that people looking at what I'd posted wouldn't be just, or, or sharing it wouldn't be inundated by um, harassment, right? Um, by accounts that have no genuine interest in actually uh, talking or learning or anything else. They're just there to um, get misinformation um, in there. And particularly around the vaccines, obviously, but, you know, COVID now, um, you see it the same thing with the wildfires and Yellowknife, uh, you know, any account, any media report is just full of people replying, saying it was arson, it wasn't real, it was all these things trying to delegitimize um, news. So I did start blocking, um, partly not so much for the personal protection, but because I refuse to be a platform, right, where that information, I don't want to be direct. Um, and it's become worse, right, um, because there is so much more of it. There, There is no point anymore, I find, on Twitter, on reporting, um, even extreme, um, you know, threats and, and to myself or other people. Um, it, nothing really happens. So I just block now. I used to religiously, um, you know, report and kind of do my part, right, to try to clean things up. And um, it, it's not really having any effect in my experience. But <clears throat> I'm not leaving Twitter because it's also a place where a lot of people come and, you know, I signed up for other platforms and, and, um, and, but there are a lot of people who still find it to be a useful interface and I'm not leaving um, because I need to still be there for people who are seeking their information there. And I'm not sure what to do at this point. I think like a lot of, um, mm -hmm. like many of us, I think we're not sure what to do. Yeah. Um, but I'm still here um, and, you know, we'll see what happens. And just a, a quick tangential question. You you just said that it's so much worse today than it was. You're referring to Twitter, and yes. is that uh, it, is that due to the new ownership, uh, Musk's purchase of Twitter and its rebranding as X, or is it just broader social trends that uh, that people are know. excuse me less patient, more volatile? Uh, you you said yourself that we're all exhausted, and I think that's I think that's a fair assessment for just about everybody and okay. people are just at the end of their rope or do you, do you know how to attribute the, uh, 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 the, the, the worsening conditions that you're experiencing? Um, uh, you know, I'm not totally sure. Um, uh, I do, you know, certainly the, um, the volume of just egregious and frank misinformation increased under the new ownership and certainly 
um, where, you know, when I used to report uh, certain tweets or accounts in the past, um, you know, it didn't all, I used to actually for a while had a pretty good sense, right, about what would be considered a problem I would report. Usually it would, um, something would be, would be done. That was starting to slip a little bit, but yes, under the new ownership, there's just, it's like, there's no point in, in even like, you know, baby eating, anti-Semitic, like that kind of stuff, right? Even that is not, is not being taken down or flagged. Um, and that has been since the new ownership and certainly the, these, these sort of swarms of, of trolls, uh, I don't know. It, it does seem worse. It does seem like there's more of it all the time. It was always a big problem. Um, and I think I attribute it to that and, uh, and, uh, but I'm not sure, but I also do think that we're seeing, um, uh, that it's not just kind of, uh, you know, bots or organized campaigns, but I do think that we're, I think that we're seeing um, some kind of, I guess, radicalization or um, a shifting of the Overton window, right, as they say, of, of um, ordinary people who are not bent on, um, you know, taking everything down, but who whose views may be shifting the more stressed they are and, and everything else. So, it's really hard, right? I try to keep that in mind that a lot of people are having a hard time and that mm -hmm. that's sometimes how we respond as human beings. And I try to listen for that when I see these responses and I sort of look at the account and see whether it looks like a real person who is struggling versus someone who's just, or an account that's just systematically trying to deny like whatever it's trying to deny. Um, but it's hard and I know people and in case our listeners aren't familiar with the term, can you define oh. the Overton window for us? Oh, yes. Yeah. So the Overton window is um, refers to, you know, uh, as a society, there's there's a range of, of um, uh, beliefs uh, or the way we think about ourselves and about our world. And there's a range of beliefs that would represent kind of the um, the, the the norm, the general norm. Uh, it's not quite it's not quite a consensus, but it's the majority of people sort of think within this range. And then outside of that window are extremes, um, it, you know, one, one end or the other. And so one of the tactics of misinformation is to try to get extreme views become part of the mainstream, so that where the Overton window is shifts to include those extreme views, so that they're no longer obvious to a lot of people as being extreme and well outside the range of what would be normally considered um, acceptable. And, uh, and there's a huge amount of that that's going on. And that's a big part of, uh, you know, these strategies, right, to, in response to every, you know, I don't know, CBC or CTV or, or, you know, what it Globe Mail news story to, to post, um, as much of this, this this extreme, a lot of it conspiracy driven, but these extreme points of view, um, because over time, if people see this enough, they start thinking that it represents more of the people who live in this country than it probably does. And then that starts shifting perspectives. Um, and, and that is really problematic. And that is a big part of what social media has um, been problematic for is, is um, uh, disrupting people's sense of what you look at the Yellowknife fires, for example. Um, I mean, it is really awful what is happening, and it's a humanitarian um, disaster. It's 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 a story that most of us understand is is really really um, concerning. But those posts, so many of them are saying it's arson, it's casting doubt, it, it's 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 all over the place. And um, and if that shifts so that people no longer look at this and say we have to do something about climate change and stop thinking that it's maybe and start thinking maybe it's not climate change then they their, their gut sense of we have to do something um and we we need to support climate change efforts may shift and they may doubt that and that's how that changes public opinion and the ability to move forward on things that are you know, patently obvious to us until the, the patent obviousness of them is undermined. So, uh, a couple of minutes ago, you 
spoke of how you were looking forward to the time when uh, uh, hopefully your efforts won't be necessary. And then you also said that there's still a fairly high degree of excess mortality in Canada. Uh, I spent a good part of July traveling within Canada. I took a couple of, of flights and on, on one flight, I was one of the only people to be wearing a mask. And then on another, I, I'd i lost my mask somewhere before the airport. And so I wasn't wearing one on the, on the plane. And again, like there might have been another person wearing a mask and uh, maybe not. I'm you know, fully vaxxed. I hope that most of the other passengers were too. But uh, I was also at a family gathering, a couple hundred people, and pretty much nobody was where nobody was wearing a mask at that. So from a public perspective, uh, yeah. it would seem that the COVID-19 pandemic is for practical purposes over. And yeah. uh, I want to get as someone who is very knowledgeable <laughs> about the current state of COVID-19 in Canada, would you share that assessment that of that broad public consensus or are we still in the grip of of the pandemic what's what's your professional uh, view of of the current state and we're recording this in mid august yeah. and this episode will be uh, should be uh, uh, released before the end of the month yeah so my professional assessment is that um, covid is still um, a serious problem in canada um, it, it's not hard to determine this if you go, for example, to the Public Health Agency of Canada website and you look at the number of people who are hospitalized. Um, the last couple of months were the best we've had in a long time, at least the best we've had since the start of the Omicron variant in December of 2021. Um, but in general, we are still running... Um, and this is even though hospital hospital reporting, there's very little testing done in hospitals anymore either for COVID. So our, our awareness of how much is out there and how many people are being hospitalized with it is, is um, those numbers are dropping. And part of that is because reporting is changing. Um, but we still, for example, in 2023, um, the weekly average of people admitted to hospital is still 16% higher than it was in 2020 or 2021. It's not as high as 2022, but 2022 was, was uh, really bad. Um, if we look at excess mortality, uh, which is the number of untimely deaths um, and is a way to estimate um, the impact of what may be happening with COVID, um, it's still 20% higher than, than in 2023 than it was in the first two years of the pandemic. So um, 2022 was a truly awful year um, with Omicron. Um, you know, there were many, many, many deaths. Um, and, um, you know, the death toll for Canada in excess mortality since uh, the beginning of 2020 now is currently nearly double the death toll of World War II or of the 1918 to 1920 flu. Um, and we're still having um, significant levels of um, excess untimely deaths um, in the country. And we're, we're, our reporting is, is getting worse and worse. So we had a period where um, things were genuinely getting much better. Um, they, they still were not low or perfectly safe. Um, but unfortunately, as of the last week or two, that is changing again. Things are going back up. And we're starting to see um, a fair number more infections, which is also um, being reported in other parts of the world. Um, and um, we'll have to see what happens for the fall. But what I would say is that people um, that yeah, you want to think about yourself, but you also want to think about other people um, who you might infect um, and also who you might encourage to put a mask on by wearing one yourself, because it's quite isolating to wear a mask and people can be judgmental. Um, and, and we're human beings and we kind of don't like to stick out. Like I feel uncomfortable wearing a mask. Sometimes I feel a bit like I need to apologize or I'm embarrassed because I'm a human being and I kind of, you know, we feel funny about being the only person in a large group. Right. Uh, I mean, I do it every but I still have those feelings. And, and so sometimes wearing a mask um, 
may also help someone who also really knows that they need to or want to wear it, but are, uh, you know, just they don't, they're not having a good day and they don't feel like they can withstand, you know, social judgment or perceived social judgment. So what, wearing a mask is important then too. But, you know, right now, <clears throat> our latest estimate is that in Canada, about one in 45 people are currently infected again. Um, as we're seeing that we're, near, we're more than 2% are currently infected. Uh, the yes. 2% of the Canadian population, more than 2% of the Canadian population right now yes. has, that's has better, COVID. That's better than it was through much of Omicron. Still. Wow. So many okay, I'm sorry. Don't. I'm, I'm blown away by this. Time, right? So it's about one in 45. Um, and we're, you know, we'll get more data again this week. And But this is why, right? We do the, these estimates so that people can sort of say, wow, one in 45 people, about one in 45 are infected. So when I go to the grocery store and there are, you know, say 200 people in the grocery store, or whatever it is, you know, there is a good chance actually that a couple of people will be infected. This is not a zero risk situation. Right, so, like the, you know, the, expected, the expected number of people would be, you know, four, four or five folks uh, in, in, with a couple of hundred people in the store. Yeah, or yeah, exactly. So it gives people a sense that it's not completely no risk, right? And a lot of people do want to actually make a decision to protect themselves or their families, but don't quite know what the situation is because there's very little information um, that's available. But numbers like that help people to say, okay, you know, in that situation, when I go into the grocery store, I'm going to put my mask on just because God knows I don't want to get sick again, right? I don't want my whole family to go through this again. I don't want it like, I'm just going to put the mask on because that's a little bit too high for my comfort level. And then for someone who is very high risk, for example, despite vaccination and everything else, these numbers are crucial, right? Because people need to know, they need to know how to do things safely. Um, they need to they need to make decisions about um activities in their lives and and so people who really do need the information it's especially important but yes one in 45 right yeah a lot of people just don't realize that there's that much out there and that's a range right. that's not, it's probably like you know plus or minus but it's about one in 45. okay we've been talking for a while so i've got a few more questions but i want to pull back a little bit um, and take sort of a broader, uh, broader scope, uh, in a, yeah. take a broader perspective on things. Um, I very much appreciate the work that you've done, uh, how, how you've you know, dedicated a large part of the last three and a half years to, uh, to, do, to doing science communication so that we can have an understanding that, oh my gosh, more than 2% of the population today, uh, Canadian population today is, uh, is infected with COVID. Um, I've got a two part question. One is, as just a member of the public, how can I f determine that Dr. Tara Moriarty is being, is a reliable source of accurate data and not and not a shill or a bot or a troll, uh, and because there are a lot of authoritative sounding profiles on Twitter that are delivering um, that are delivering you know f fake information, false information, misinformation, disinformation for whatever reason they're wrong, um, deliberately or or not, and uh, and what can organizations like uh, so so the two part question is. How can individuals, listeners of this, the listeners to this podcast, uh, be able to distinguish between reliable sources of information from people like yourself and unreliable sources of information? And the second part of the question is, what can organizations like the Center for Inquiry Canada do to amplify your your uh, your voice and the voices of people like you to get the message out to? more people like we're doing what we can and that's one of the reasons why i have you on podcast for inquiry but is there something else that we can be doing to uh uh to help give accurate information to people yeah. so that they can make informed decisions about yeah. their lives yeah so i don't know if i have uh, answers to all these questions um you know 
uh, so, and in some ways it's like, uh, so for example, I really don't know much about how my car works, right? So how do you, um, how do I determine uh, what a good mechanic is to go to and whether I'm going to get an honest appraisal and, you know, all these questions that we right. have. Right. You, you, you go to someone that you trust who does have that knowledge and you take their recommendation. That's the, the, exactly. That's often how things happen. Um, and a lot of it is about building personal relationships. But, you know, one of the things I always look for is um, we make mistakes, right? So uh, we make small mistakes, like I'm forever making small, well, and sometimes big mistakes in my Twitter posts. And, you know, I'll go back and be like, oh, I said this and I meant, you know, so people who will correct, but also people who will um, change their their view on things um, uh, and have historically as more evidence comes in and and um, are okay about um, um are okay talking about that and talking about things um, in a gray way, not absolutely black and white, um, in a way that says, this is what we, and who talk a lot about the things we don't know, um, even though we'd like to know better. So those are things that I um, trust um, because uh, first of all, it, it um, it's someone who is treating the person that they're speaking with as um, a person who um, is able to make decisions themselves and wants information. It's a conversation, right? When you're talking in a more gray way, um, instead of being a, you know, a, where you're directing, you know, your views towards someone else, um, in, instead of it being conversational. Anyway, that's partly probably personal, but certainly, um, you know, being able to talk in gray, talking in uncertainties, um, and uh, I think that that's a really important thing. And then in terms of reaching people, I honestly, after all this time, think that so much of what this is, is about relationships and about building trust and that people find us or find me and, and then they decide for themselves, right? Whether I meet, whether we meet or I meet a need that they have and they may or may not um, be interested in the way I'm talking about things, but if they do, at least they found me and then, or found us and found what we're doing. And so I think a lot of it, you know, we know that the, the biggest thing we need to do is, for example, be doing media interviews all the time. Be, we had a campaign last year because we were really trying to reach outside urban centers. We we're really trying to reach people who, um, who, for example, might listen to things or might not have uh, high reading levels, right? Because we tend to talk to the highly educated as well, which is a problem. So we started contacting a lot of small media markets to do radio interviews and other things like that. And a lot of it is just simply hard work going out and making sure that people hear about us, that if there's something in a newspaper or online, that the link to what we do, or even we have Q and A sessions that we run every every week. Uh, we have uh, data sessions; they're perfectly free. They're open to anyone on Zoom. People can be anonymous, drop in, participate, do whatever they want. Talk directly with scientists as part of a group of people, um, but letting people know that that resource is out there. Because most people who find that, for example, say, "I had never heard about you until so and so did covered it," and I can't right. believe I. No, and so that's part of well, it. Just we'll, getting I, I mean, that's and, great, and we'll I'll put I'll put a link to that in in the show notes. So uh, people, if people are interested, they can uh, they can go there. Yeah. If they if they if they would like to, right? Um, yeah. We're there if people if people want to find us or want to to seek us out. All right, and what can CFIC do to amplify uh, your message? Um, I, you know, I think that anything that you can do related to uh, always, I'm, I'm concerned that the, the forecast, the COVID forecast gets out so that people can make decisions to protect themselves. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think that would be the, the main thing. I mean, we're starting a, we're actually starting a program, a series, um, which we're hopefully starting October 1st-ish um, called uh, Science with Humanity. Um, where we are um, 
trying to where we're going to have sort of high profile scientists, but also people who are not scientists actually talk about the aspects of living through a pandemic and and um, that people can it'll be they'll be um, uh, live streamed and it'll be a way for people to um, uh, you know interact with uh, people who have uh, expertise and suggestions in different areas, including people living through this. Um, so, you know, we will contact you and we will say, listen, this is what the calendar is going to be. This is what the series, if you want to share this with your membership, so anyone who can attend, who wants to attend can, that's a big help for us. So anyone can, who can help information get out. Um, and then otherwise, just exactly what you do here, right? Where you provide a way to, for me to talk about this in a, complex non one line kind of ways that people can understand uh and form opinions and decide whether to trust or not right based on conversations like this all right thank you and please be in touch with me when uh science with humanity right. launches and we'll uh i'd like to be a part of that uh last question <laughs> last last question for you uh you you referred to the 1918-1919 uh, flu pandemic of about a century ago, and uh, we, and by we I mean uh, humanity, particularly infectious disease specialists, scientists, knew that uh, th there's no reason that couldn't happen again. We didn't know no. when, we didn't know how, we didn't know how it was going to, to originate, but uh, when... You've got billions of people in the world. It's an opportunity for some form of parasite to thrive in, in these host bodies. So we knew that there was a strong possibility of a pandemic at some point. Now, it had been 100 years and we hadn't had one. But yeah. how ready were we? What did we do to prepare for uh, some sort of pandemic uh, coming, uh, coming our way prior to COVID? And uh, what are your thoughts about what we can do uh, for the next one, because it will get, it looks like we're getting through, we're like we're not past it, but we're you know this isn't COVID isn't going to destroy our civilization, but there will be yeah. another pandemic in the next decade, in the next fifty years, in the next century, and so are we? What can we do to be better prepared for the next one? Yeah. So what I would say is that, um, you know, this was not what we just are experiencing now. It's not influenza pandemic. Uh, we do actually expect that probability wise, there should be another major influenza epidemic, you know, soonish, right? We're overdue. So actually we could be seeing another pandemic, say of influenza. We don't know, could be shortly, could be, that is still very much in the horizon. We're not looking at um, you know, we're not looking at we're few or fine for another hundred years um, because, you know, there's still a very good chance we could have a major flu pandemic. Um, and, you know, the, the more people have been sick with another respiratory virus, the more um, there could be challenges, right, associated right. with Right. So if, 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 a, if a influenza pandemic uh, evolves in the next five years where... I don't know, over yeah. half the population has experienced COVID or, or perhaps even more, then it, yeah. it will be that much worse. It, it could be. We, we don't know, but yes, it could be. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, I think that, so here's what I would say. The, um, the inquiries into SARS-1, um, for example, um, when that happened in Canada, had a set of recommendations. Um, so this was a, a, another coronavirus, and I don't know if people remember SARS-1, but it had a very high mortality rate and um, it was contained. Um, but the recommendations from that inquiry um, drove a lot of what the preparations were that happened after that. But there turned out to be all kinds of challenges with communication, right? Where even though the recommendations were on paper in provinces and people were supposed to be doing things, there were things like, you know, the the national stockpile of, of respirators had been allowed to expire. There were there were and no one knew, actually, because no one was checking in with the, the, the federal people or the provincial people and everyone assumed that someone else had them. So some of these things were implemented on paper, but 
uh, they weren't actually being, um, you know, taken seriously um, in terms of following up, and it was the the um, it had been fragmented. But most of the recommendations from the inquiries that followed SARS could be made exactly the same right now. We still have a substantial amount of influence. Um, of uh, so decision making, it needs to be made by political leaders as well as um, public health, for example, leaders. Um, and it does need to be made um, together. Um, public health leaders don't always understand or, or they're not responsible for many other needs or aspects of citizens. Um, but there also have been enormous problems related to communication related to sharing information with the federal government. Um, there has been a real problem with data sharing um, and with any kind of uh, unified strategy. There's been a lot of, um, you know, there've been a lot of pissing contests and a lot of turf drawing that has really hampered the response, hampered our ability to uh, respond quickly and effectively and is causing really big problems now. Um, where essentially we have a vacuum of, of leadership pretty much across the country right now. And, um, and some of these topics are things that were covered in previous inquiries and we didn't act on them. Um, we didn't really, you know, and um, I don't see right now that we would actually have the will to do kind of what we already know we need to do. That's what I am the most worried about is that is that we just won't do it even though we know what we need to do and i'm quite worried right now actually um i i think maybe we're still in the thick of things and i think i'm feeling quite discouraged about what responses have been like and the 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 lack of um i guess responsibility in the term like uh i think that we haven't had um public figures taking responsibility. I think a lot of our response has been characterized by deflection of blame and um, sort of messaging, right? And uh, managing messaging instead of genuinely trying to respond to the needs of people. I'm very worried about that, but I think it's something I'm worried about generally um, with our democratic, I think I'm worried in general about our you know, this is a this is a problem in many parts of the world that um, that people are feeling increasingly disenfranchised um, from decision making structures and, and less sort of respected and more managed. And this is a feeling that has grown for me, which is a surprising feeling for me. Um, but I'm not. I'm pretty worried about how we would respond to another crisis and um, you know, and with the climate change. I'm pretty worried, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Where five years ago, I would have had a little bit more faith in our ability to come together. That doesn't mean that that can't change, right? And, and I've learned in the last three and a half years that an individual saying, I'm going to try to do something to help, I don't know if I can, but I'm going to try, can make a difference. I've experienced that directly. It's been profound. And a lot of people that I know and work with and have been part of this process have experienced how important an individual's actions are. So we're not powerless. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and that I think you just keep trying, right? You keep getting up, you keep trying, you keep trying to move the dial and make a difference. And that's yeah. all you can do. As a I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. There's no yeah. guarantee that you know, no. your efforts or, or my efforts are going to no. make a difference. But if you don't try, and I don't try, then yeah. we can guarantee that nothing is going to change. And, yeah. and, that's, and, and that is actually what animates my activism as well and why I yeah. do this and, 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 and many other things. And it's crucial to give people hope, right? It's crucial for people to see that someone is saying, I refuse to kind of give in to this. I, I'm going to try. Um, and especially the more public you are, right? It gives people hope so that because people losing hope and people saying, I can't make a difference, I can't, why I can't do it anymore. People losing hope is actually a very dangerous thing, right? Because people disengage. So it's very important to say, I may not be perfect, 
I'm, but in my whatever, I'm still going to try and I don't quite know how I'm going to do it, but I refuse, you know, to, to give in and, and, and it helps people to see that because each one of us has that, you know, that ability, but sometimes we need to see other people doing the same and you say, okay, all right, here's what I'm going to do. And uh, we need that. I, and I think that's a, a perfect note to end yeah. on. Uh, Dr. Tara Moriarty, thank you for taking the time oh, to speak with me. If people I'm want to, glad. if, if people to want to learn more about you and, and, and to follow you, uh, where, where, where can they, where can they access uh, all of your, uh, your, your efforts to communicate? Yeah. So, well, I don't know about all, but um, so we have a website called covid19resources.ca. So you can search for that in your, um, in your browser. And then I mainly communicate on Twitter and my handle is at Moriarty, M-O-R-I-A-R-T-Y, like, like Professor Moriarty from Sherlock Holmes, um, at (laughs) Moriarty Lab. And, um, but you can find our website and sometimes it's a little like, you know, uh, backyard looking because we're almost always run by volunteers and we're never quite, we've always got updates, updates and things we need to do. So please excuse that it, uh, that it, uh, that it's not as professional looking as some, um, but we try to post our, all our information there on a regular basis, as well as information about our drop-in sessions and the different programs that we provide. And uh, we come to you warts and all, <laughs> and we welcome you warts and all as well. We're just all trying to, you know, get through things together. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Leslie, so much. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Links for today's discussion can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please show your support at patreon.com slash podcast for inquiry and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Email us podcast at centerforinquiry.ca. We'd love to hear your perspective. The Podcast for Inquiry is brought to you by the Center for Inquiry Canada. We are a national educational charity supporting reason, compassion, and secular values. Help us support rational discourse and evidence-based decision-making by becoming a member at centerforinquiry.ca slash join. CFIC is on the web and Facebook and Twitter at CFI Canada. Podcast for Inquiry is produced and edited by Lee Shields, Zach Dumont, and Martin Zielinski. Music by Anthony Lazaro. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblatt. See you next time.